Hello, this is video lecture number 28, Aristocratic Republicanism and Slavery. We have three sections that we are going to cover today. The first is the revolution in slavery from 76 to 1800, the North and South grow apart, and the Missouri Crisis from 1819 to 1821. So the impact of the revolutionary commitment to republicanism was felt in all regions of the nation. Uh, in the South, it was tempered by the dominance of plantation slavery. Driven by the demands of British and American textile factories for cotton, Southern planters surged halfway across the continent in pursuit of their own version of American opportunity. By 1819, the slaveholders' understanding of Republican expansion was starting to clash with that of Northern whites. In particular, those opposed to the, quote, peculiar institution uh, were determined to keep slavery out of Western territories. The Missouri controversy brought into sharp relief the issues separating the opposing sides. Uh, Robert Walsh Jr. thought the Constitution empowered Congress to curtail the migration of slaves into the new territories, and he sought confirmation of his position from James Madison, the father of the Constitution. Uh, some were fearful uh, lest the profits generated by the domestic traffic in slaves should transform the Old South into a, uh, quote, second Africa, uh, from which the, uh, quote, pestilence, misery, and desolation of slavery would overspread the Western country uh, and eventually the world. But even those who described slavery as a curse and found the prospect of its expanding into new territories as appalling uh, focused almost exclusively on its negative impact on whites rather than on the slaves themselves. Uh, for Ferdinando Fairfax's plan for emancipation highlights the limitations of what passed for anti-slavery opinion in Virginia, uh, and Benjamin Banneker's letter reveals the limits of Thomas Jefferson's belief in equality. Not surprisingly, uh, the goal of the American Colonization Society, the most prominent anti-slavery organization prior to the 1830s uh, was to send free blacks to Africa. The unalterable prejudices of most white Americans, Madison reasoned, uh, required of free blacks that they be permanently removed beyond the region occupied by or allotted to a white population. So let's get into this a little deeper with our first section which is the revolution and slavery. The Patriots' struggle for independence from Britain raised the prospect of freedom for enslaved Africans. Uh, many slaves sought freedom by fleeing behind British lines. Many slaves also fought for the Patriot cause in return for the promise of freedom. In 1782, Virginia passed an act allowing manumission. Uh, within a decade, 10,000 slaves had been freed. Quakers and Christian evangelical churches advocated emancipation, and Enlightenment philosophy also worked to undermine slavery and racism. By 1804, every state north of Delaware had enacted laws to provide for the termination of slavery. Emancipation came slowly because whites feared competition for jobs and housing, and they also feared a melding of the races. In the South, slaves represented a huge financial investment, uh, and resistance against freedom for blacks was strong. Although Virginia allowed manumission in 1782, Thomas Jefferson and others sent petitions arguing that slavery was a necessary evil, required to maintain white supremacy and the luxurious planter lifestyle. The debate over emancipation among Southern whites ended in 1800 when a group of slaves was hanged for planning an uprising. Southern whites redefined republicanism so that it only applied to the, uh, quote, master race. Our next section is the North and South Grow Apart. Both in theory and in practice, republicanism in the South differed significantly from that in the North, and European visitors commonly noted the poverty and lack of strong work ethic in the South. 
Uh, some Southerners admitted that slavery corrupted their society and contributed to the ignorance and poverty of the mass of the white population. Slavery quickly found its way into national politics uh, and remained a contested issue. Uh, when Congress ended American participation in the Atlantic slave trade in 1808, uh, Northerners called for the regulation of interstate trade in slaves uh, and the emancipation of illegally imported slaves, uh, while Southerners mounted a defense of their labor system. After 1800, political conflict over slavery increased as the North ended slavery, uh, and the South expanded its slave-based agricultural economy into the lower Mississippi Valley as the tobacco economy declined and was replaced with the cotton boom. In 1817, the founders of a group called the American Colonization Society uh, proposed to end slavery by encouraging southern planters to emancipate their slaves. The society would then arrange for their resettlement in Africa to prevent racial conflict. Most free blacks, however, rejected this idea completely. Uh, lacking support from either blacks or whites, the American Colonization Society was a dismal failure, uh, transporting only 6,000 African Americans to Liberia, a colony that it established on the west coast of Africa. All right, our final section is the Missouri Crisis. When Missouri applied for admission to the Union as a slave state in 1819, Congressman James Talmadge of New York proposed a ban on the importation of slaves into Missouri and the gradual emancipation of its black inhabitants. When Missouri whites rejected Talmadge's proposals, the northern majority in the House of Representatives blocked the territory's admission to the Union. To underline their commitment, then, to slavery, Southerners used their power in the Senate, where they held half the seats, uh, to withhold statehood from Maine. Uh, which was seeking to separate itself from Massachusetts. Southerners advanced three constitutional arguments. They raised the principle of equal rights for the states. Uh, they argued that slavery was purely an internal state affair, uh, and they maintained that Congress had no authority to infringe on the property rights of slaveholders. Henry Clay finally put together a series of political arguments uh, known collectively as the Missouri Compromise. The Compromise set a precedent for admission of states to the Union in pairs, one free uh, and one slave. And Southern congressmen accepted legislation that prohibited slavery in the rest of the Louisiana Purchase Territory uh, north of the southern boundary of Missouri. The task of reconciling regional differences had become difficult, and the specter of civil war lurked in the background. This does conclude video lecture number 28. Please answer the review questions and continue on with your study.